all day long we kept this up without water for the mules and without ever changing the team. At last, at least we kept it up ten hours, which I take it is a day and a pretty honest one in, in an alkali desert. It was from four in the morning till two in the afternoon, and it was so hot and so close, and our water canteens went dry in the middle of the day, and we got so thirsty. It was so stupid and tiresome and dull, and the tedious hours did lag and drag and limp along with such a cruel deliberation. It was so trying to give one's watch a good long undisturbed spell, and then take it out and find that it had been fooling away the time and not trying to get ahead any. The alkali dust cut through our lips. It persecuted our eyes. It ate through the delicate membranes and made our noses bleed and kept them bleeding. And truly and seriously, the romance all faded from far away and disappeared and left the desert trip nothing but a harsh reality, a thirsty, sweltering, longing, hateful reality. Two miles and a quarter an hour for 10 hours, that was what we accomplished. It was hard to bring the comprehension away down to such a snail pace as that, when we had been used to making eight and 10 miles an hour. When we reached the station on the further verge of the desert, we were glad for the first time that the dictionary was along, because we never could have found language to tell how glad we were in any sort of dictionary, but, a, but an unabridged one with pictures in it. But there could not have been found in a whole library of dictionaries language sufficient to tell how tired those mules were after that, after their 23-mile pull. To try to give the reader an idea of how thirsty they were would be to gild refined gold or paint the lily. Somehow, now, there is there it is there. The quotation does not seem to fit. But no matter, let it stay anyhow. I think it is graceful, and I think it is a graceful and attractive thing, and therefore have t tried time and time again to work it in where it would fit, but could not succeed. These efforts have kept my mind distracted and ill at ease, and made my narrative seem broken and disjointed in places. Under these circumstances, it seems to me best to leave it in as above, since this will afford at least a temporary respite from the wear and tear of trying to lead up to this really apt and beautiful quotation. Chapter 19. The Digger Indians compared with the Bushmen of Africa. Food, life, and characteristics. Cowardly attack on a stagecoach. A brave driver. The noble red man. On the morning of the 16th day out from St. Joseph, we, we arrived at the entrance of Rocky Canyon, 250 miles from Salt Lake. It was along in this wild country somewhere, and far from any habitation of white men, except the stage stations, that we came across the wretchedest type of mankind I have ever seen up to this writing. I refer to the Gushu Indians. From what we could see, and all we could learn, they are very considerably inferior to even the despised Digger Indians of California, inferior to all races of savages on our continent, inferior to even the Terra del Fuegans, inferior to the Hottentots, and actually inferior in some respects to the Cayetes of, of Africa. Indeed, I have been obliged to look the bulky volumes of Wood's uncivilized races of man clear through in order to find a savage tribe degraded enough to take rank with the Gushus. I find but one people fairly open to that shameful verdict. It is the Boss Jossmans, Bushmen, of South Africa. Such of the Gushus as we saw along the road and hanging about the stations were small, lean, scrawny creatures, in complexion a dull black, like the ordinary American Negro, their faces and hands bearing dirt which they had been hoarding and accumulating for months, years, and even generations, according to the age of the proprietor. A silent, sneaking, treacherous-looking race, taking note of everything covertly, like all the other noble red men that we do not read about. 
and betraying no sign in their countenances, indolent, everlasting, patient, and tireless, like all other Indians, prideless beggars. For if the beggar instinct were left out of an Indian, he would not go any more than a clock without a pendulum. Hungry, always hungry, and yet never refusing anything that a hog would eat, though not often eating what a hog would decline. Hunters, but having no higher ambition than to kill and eat jackass rabbits, crickets and grasshoppers, and embezzle carrion from the buzzards and coyotes. Savages who, when asked if they have a, a common Indian belief in a great spirit, show us something which almost amounts to emotion, thinking whiskey is referred to. A thin, scattering race of almost naked black children, these gushuts are, who produce nothing at all and have no villages and no gatherings together into strictly defined tribal communities. A people whose only shelter is a rag cast on a bush to keep off a portion of the snow and yet who inhabit one of the most rocky, wintry, repulsive ways that our country or any other can exhibit. The Bushmen in our Gashuts are manifestly descended from the self-same gorilla or kangaroo or Norway rat, whichever animal Adam the Darwinians trace them to. One would as soon expect the rabbits to fight as the Gushuts and yet they used to live off the offal and refuse of the stations a few months, and then come some dark night when no mischief was expected and burned down the buildings and killed the men from ambush as they rushed out. And once in the night they attacked the stagecoach when a district judge of Nevada Territory was the only passenger. And with their first volley of arrows and a bullet or two, they riddled the stage curtains, wounded a horse or two, and mortally wounded the driver. The latter was full of pluck, and so was his passenger. At the driver's call, Judge Mott swung himself out, clambered to the box, and seized the reins of the team. And away they plunged through the racing mob of skeletons and under a hurtling storm of missiles. The stricken driver had sunk down on the boot as soon as he was wounded, but had held on to the reins and said he would manage to keep hold of them until relieved. And after they were taken from his relaxing grasp, he lay with his head between Judge Mott's feet and tranquilly gave directions about the road. He said he believed he could live till the miscreants were outrun and left behind, and that if he managed that, the main difficulty would be at an end. And then if the judge drove so-and-so, giving directions about bad places in the road and general course, he would reach the next station without trouble. The judge distanced the enemy and at last rattled up to the station and knew that the night's perils were done, but there was no comrade in arms for him to rejoice with, for the soldierly driver was dead. Let us forget that we have been saying harsh things about the overland drivers now. The disgust which with the Kashuts gave me, a disciple of Cooper and a worshiper of the Red Man, even of the scholarly savages in the last of the Mohicans, who are fittingly associated with backwoodsmen who divide each sentence into two equal parts, one part critically grammatical, refined, and choice of language, and the other part just such an attempt to talk like a hunter or a mountaineer as a Broadway clerk might make after eating an edition of Emerson Bennett's works and studying frontier life at the Bowery Theater a couple of weeks. I say that the nausea which the Gashuts gave me, an Indian worshiper, set me to examining authorities to see if, perchance, I had been overestimating the red man while viewing him through the mellow moonshine of romance. The revelations that came were disenchanting. It was curious to see how quickly the paint and tinsel fell away from him and left him treacherous, filthy, and repulsive, and how quickly the evidence accumulated that wherever one finds an Indian tribe, he has only found Gashutes more or less modified by circumstances and surroundings. But Gashutes, after all, they deserve pity, poor creatures, and they can have mine at this distance. Nearby, they never get anybody's. There is an impre impression aboard that the Baltimore and Washington Railroad Company and many of its employees are Gashutes, but it is an error. There is only a plausible resemblance which, while it is apt enough to mislead the ignorant, cannot deceive parties who have contemplated both tribes. But seriously, it was not only poor wit, but very wrong to start the report referred to above. 
For however innocent the motive may have been, the necessary effect was to injure the reputation of a class who have had a hard enough time of it in the pitiless deserts of the Rocky Mountains. Heaven knows. If we cannot find it in our hearts to give those poor naked creatures our Christian sympathy and compassion, in God's name, let us, let us at least not throw mud at them. Chapter 20. 